It started. Yeah. As a convener, I welcome all of you present online today. A good morning. A very good morning to one and all present with us today in the second day of International Universal Workshop on Global Seismology and Tectonics. First of all, a big thanks to all the participants who attended the lecture by Professor Andrew Michael yesterday. Let's bridge ourselves for another inviting session of knowledge sharing and integration today by Dr. Walter D. Mooney from USGS, who is going to deliver a talk on tectonics and seismicity of Indonesia and Southeast Asia. But before going to his talk, may I request our session chairperson, Professor J.R. Kyle, to speak a few words. Over to J.R. Kyle, sir. It's my great privilege and pleasure to say a few words or to make some remarks about Professor Walter Muni of USGS. He's my very good friend, very warm friend. And I think there is no art scientist or seismologists in the world who does not know Walter Mooney. He's a global seismologist in true sense, literally a global seismologist. Any earthquakes in the world, big earthquakes in any country or any island, I think he is there to investigate. Dr. Walter Mooney is not only known as a global seismologist, but he is, I think, most warm person, most lively person, most jovial person in our community, in our science community. I had a chance to visit USGS on his warm invitation in 2007, immediately after my retirement from GSI, Geological Survey of India. Walter told me, now you are a free bird, you come to USGS. The every day in the Menlo Park USGS office, I still remember the road, the Walter's guest house, the office, every day Walter's warm hospitality. Then he took me to not only that, he took me to Mexico to attend the AGO meeting in 2007. And he fully sponsored me to attend this meeting. And it was a wonderful time where we also met Professor Talani, Professor S.K. Singh and all. It's very sad that Mrs. Talani is no more. We also had a good time with her in the in this Acapulco, Mexico conference. So Walter is is a is my most warm friend, and he is the person, the great seismologist who wrote preface of my book. When I told Walter, why don't you write a preface for my book? Within almost 24 hours, he got me the preface draft. It was fantastic. If you have all read my book on seismology and seismotectonics of South Asia, then you might have read Walter's preface. So he is a my most warm friend, my most, respect, most respected friend. My all regards to Professor Walter Muni and we will today listen to him, his great experience, large experience, vast experience in seismology and in particular Indonesian seismicity and seismotectonics, which is very much connected with the Northeast India region subduction tectonics. Walter Muni, thank you so much. We are very so pleased, so happy to have you here in this, in this workshop today morning. Thank you so much, please. May I now request, uh, thank you, sir. May I now request our co session chairperson, Dr. Saurabh Purwa, to say a few words. How about to Dr. Saurabh Purwa, sir? Yeah, yeah, I have just uh, heard uh, Professor Kayal. Uh, uh, we are really fortunate, not only fortunate, we are really, really fortunate 
that today our chief guest is Professor Walter Muni, who is renowned worldwide. And on behalf of CSIR NIST, I really thank you, sir, for considering our invitation. And we are really overwhelmed by your presence. We are eagerly waiting to hear you uh, in this session, sir. That's all from my side, Professor Walter Muni. Now, let me uh, read out a summarized by data of our keynote speaker, Dr. Walter D. Muni. Walter Muni is a research seismologist and geophysicist at the US <laughs> Geological Survey. <coughs> Park. Muni was the branch chief of seismology from 1994 to 1997. He has led fieldwork throughout North and South America and participated in extensive research affiliations with colleagues in Mexico, Europe, Russia, China, Taiwan, Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand, and East Africa. He is the program leader for the USGS contribution to the Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning System and has extensive experience at leading training. His major interest is global earth crust structure and tectonics, particularly the continental lithosphere. Professor Muni has authored more than 170 papers and reports including publications in renowned journals like Science, Journal of Geophysical Research, Technophysics, etc. Muni is a consulting professor of geophysics at Stanford University and visiting faculty at the following institutions like University of Karlsruhe, Yale University, <laughs> University of Paris, <laughs> University of Strasbourg, <laughs> Rice University, and California Institute of Technology. He is a fellow of American Geophysical Union, the Royal Astronomical Society, and the Geological Society of London. He received the Global Medal, uh, Gold Medal Award in 2002 from the Indian Geophysical Union and was elected Foreign Fellow by European Academy in 2004. In 1995, he was awarded the Geological Society of America's George P. Pollard Award. Of course, it's a very short bio and for some perspective. He has a Wikipedia page to his name. Now over to you, Dr. Muni. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for your warm welcome. And I will try to bring up my screen, my slides. There we are. Well, that was a very warm and generous uh, welcome from all of each of you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And the only reason I have had any amount of success, whatever success I've had, it's because of my colleagues like those who just spoke and the other many people worldwide who have been so generous in sharing their knowledge and experience with me. So thank you all for that. This is a great symposium. I understand it's 12 days. And as you know, my topic is on the tectonics and seismicity of Indonesia in the South Asian region. So thank you all who have worked so hard to make this virtual uh, seminar, virtual workshop a success. I know it's taken weeks and weeks and months of coordination and um, sacrifice by all the conveners, organizers, technical leaders, and so on. Thank you all very much. Today, I would like to talk to you about this very special and very interesting region of the world. You know, when I first saw the tectonic map of Indonesia, I was taken aback. If you look at eastern Indonesia, it's so complicated and so diverse with subduction zones in every direction. It seemed overwhelming, in fact. However, on further reflection, I realized that in some ways you can divide Indonesia and South Asia into two basic units to the west, including Borneo, Malaysia, Thailand and elsewhere, and Sumatra and Java, you have this continental block 
which uh, has very shallow water. If the sea level were to go much lower, all of this region would be above sea, sea level and be a very clear continent. Whereas to the east, Indonesia, Philippines, and these other uh, regions are a very complicated array of subduction zones, island arcs, accretionary prisms, and ocean-ocean collision zones. So we have a two-part system, and today we're going to see how the, they have evolved very differently. The purpose of today's talk is to talk about the evolution and present structure of the region, and I'll also talk about the hazards that are well known. Oceans and continents. Oceanic crust is about 12 kilometers thick and um, is found beneath about four to five kilometers of water. There's a transition zone from ocean to continent about 100 kilometers wide. And we'll look at that transition today as it's seen in Indonesia. Continental crust has an average thickness of about 40 kilometers and is uh, made of at least three layers here. I identify them as upper, middle, and lower crust with increasing velocity and density as you go down through the crust. Now, this is going to turn out to be a very critical aspect of the evolution of Indonesia. So how do we discern, how do we learn how this complicated region has evolved? Well, one method is to look at the seafloor magnetic anomalies, which are presently available in the Philippine Sea, in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere, and to run the tape recorder backward to reconstruct. So we won't go back that far in time, but we'll go back at least to when India was part of Africa and Australia, located some several thousand kilometers away from South Asia. There was subduction uh, in the proto-South Asia, and already we had the existence of the blocks that would become today uh, Sumatra, Burma, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Tibetan Plateau. As you know, beginning at about 110 million years ago, India broke off from Africa and Australia and began its, began its journey to the north. Um, it's, there is good evidence because of the presence of magmatic rocks, that there were actually were two subduction zones, one subduction zone in the, in the ocean and one located uh, at the southern margin. By 70 million years, India has moved much further north and is beginning to approach the southern margin of Asia. And we still have no sign of eastern Indonesia, completely absent. So the ancient portion of Indonesia is all to the west, including Borneo, Java, Sumatra, and this region. We also have no South China Sea, no Celebes Sea. These will all develop very rapidly. At 45 million years, finally, the collision of India, the uh, continent-continent collision, replacing the subduction of oceanic crust and the beginning of the development of the Philippines and Indonesia. And we can see that with a larger blow up of our study area. Already we have a two part system beneath Java, Borneo and Sumatra. The Indian Australian ocean crust is subducting beneath this continental margin. However, in eastern Indonesia, we have multiple subduction zones uh, facing each other. So we have double subduction. And in the interior, in the Celebes Sea and Philippine Sea, 
We have seafloor spreading going on, quite an active region. We only have traces of the island arcs and accretionary prisms that will later become Eastern Indonesia and the Philippines. Only small fragments of those have been born. By 30 million years, we have quite a development happening in Eastern Indonesia. The proto South China Sea has, has begun caused by spreading, uh, as you can see in um, that region. The Philippine Sea has grown tremendously and a dual subduction system is, um, is still, still operating. At 15 million years, we have a mature situation. India has now begun to dock with South Asia and the um, continent of Australia has begun to collide with, the, with, East, with East India. Let's take a look at that with a close-up of our study area. Here we see, again, ongoing ocean continent subduction in, in Western Indonesia, beneath Sumatra, Burma, and Borneo, and the moving and uh, uh, adjustment of the oceanic plates in the Philippine Sea, Celebes Sea, and the beginning early formation of the islands that will become Sulawesi and Mindanao in Indonesia. Finally, at five million years before present, we have almost the present day formation, a great complex amalgamation of islands and formations in Eastern Indonesia, including the formation and rifting of New Guinea away from Australia and the um, beginning of strike slip faulting at the northern boundary of Australia. So our present day situation is again presented here. This is a bathymetric map with the inferred plate boundaries shown uh, as heavy black lines, volcanic arcs quite visible. And what we're going to look at today is how this entire complex system is expressed in terms of its seismicity and active tectonics. It's a great area to study and is one of the most interesting, complex and fascinating parts of the world. So conclusion number one from what I presented is quite simple. Ocean continent subduction is steady, uniform and long lasting, whereas Ocean ocean subduction is complex, rapidly evolving, and very short lived. Let's go back to our diagram. The entire subduction system in eastern Indonesia and the Philippines is very short lived, small subduction systems, transient, constantly changing. I do have a request on my screen. Um, allow that maybe I should read what this says. No. Okay, I'll ignore that there's a message on my screen. I will ignore it unless I get something urgent from someone. So uh, returning, so you can see this very complicated geometry of subduction zones, sometimes uh, double subduction zones, strike slip faulting. All of this. As, as I said here, is complex, rapidly evolving, and short-lived. So I am going to introduce today the C.V. Raman Prize to the geophysicists who can explain this observation that we see in Indonesia. The prize is for someone who can tell us why ocean-ocean subduction is more complex, 
shorter lived than and shorter lived than ocean continent subduction. We need a complete theory in terms of math, physics, and geophysics for understanding the evolution of oceanic subduction systems as compared to the very stable and long-lived system that we see under beneath continents. So I'm calling this the C.V. Raman Prize, and we hope that someone will step up to solve this problem in terms of mathematics, physics, and geophysics. So let's look at the seismicity of the region. Indonesia is a seismologist's dream because it's, it has some of the highest seismicity uh, rate that you can find anywhere on Earth. This is the last five years, so it does not include the, the great Andaman uh, earthquake, 2004. And you can see the pattern of seismicity. Abundant shallow seismicity shown in blue and spread throughout Indonesia, even some deep seismicity in red going down to uh, almost 700 kilometers. And we'll look at that. If you look at 20 years of seismicity, Indonesia is really, really busy and enormous amount of activity with lack of seismicity and a stable stable continental crust in this whole region of Malaysia, Borneo, and uh, the northern part of Sumatra. Basically an interplate region that is surrounded by a very active region. All of the maps that I'm showing you today uh, were made by my students and I. They're based on uh, data available from the U.S. Geological Survey um, National Earthquake Information Center. Here's the seismicity that is only the intermediate to deep seismicity. So it cleans up the plot quite a bit. If we look at Sumatra and Java, um, th these are events greater than 100 kilometers depths, still a very large number of, of events. And the really deep earthquakes are abundant uh, north of Timor and become fewer as you go to the west. Very abundant deep seismicity in the, uh, beneath the Celebes Sea. So let's look at a few cross sections. We're now in central Indonesia, and we're going to look at cross section D and E. Cross section D is, of course, eastern Java, and uh, cross section E is uh, the boundary between Sumatra and Java. Here's the cross section. What is going on? This is really remarkable. We have abundant shallow seismicity going down to 200 kilometers, then this 300 kilometer wide gap, and then deep seismicity. What is going on? We need to know whether or not there has been break off of the slab or whether the stress regime has such that it's a neutral portion of the slab and there's a lack of seismicity because stresses are very low. Trying to understand this pattern is a very big challenge and an interesting challenge. The way we can solve this is by seismic tomography and we can look to see whether or not the slab is indeed continuous from the surface to a depth of 600 kilometers. Cross section E. Cross section E is located here in Western Java. And here, again, we, we see a pronounced seismicity gap below a depth of about 200 kilometers, and then one sole lonely earthquake at a depth of 600, suggesting that, that this could be continuous, but it needs to be determined from seismic tomography. Looking further 
to the north and in southern Philippines and Celebes Sea, we have two cross sections. We've made two cross sections, A and B, through this very abundant zone of earthquakes where you can see there's everything from shallow, intermediate to deep. The ideal kind of cross section. Look at that amount of seismicity. It's absolutely amazing. And we have double subduction zones. You'll see soon that there's actually two subducting plates. OK, here's cross section A. Here's the Sangi slab that's hanging down, going down to 650 kilometers. And in, within this other cluster, you have the Philippine sea slab and the Cotobato slab over here. Now, for this region, I am going to show you seismic tomography so you can see more about the geometry. Look at cross section B in the southern uh, Philippines and northern Indonesia. And here, the slab seems to be very continuous, and we have earthquakes all the way down. How do we explain this? How do we explain the very unexpected and different behavior of subducting oceanic crust, sometimes with continuous seismicity and sometimes with large gaps? As I said, there's double subduction zone here, and there's a uh, east dipping slab as well as a west dipping slab. So let's look at the evidence coming from seismic tomography. This is the work of Fan and Da Peng Zhao in Tohoku University in Japan, 2019. And we're looking at cross section G here, which is southernmost Philippines similar to where we were just looking. You can see from the tomography that the seismicity seems to follow a high velocity, high P wave velocity blue zone. And so the slab seems to be continuous. And here is the Philippine sea plate subducting here and uh, the other small slab that was subducting there. Now let's look at some of the um, cross sections D, E, F, and G. We're not going to look at all of them, but we're looking at D, E, F, and G. These are shown here and here. Look how mobile the oceanic slab is. It seems to subduct, perhaps break off, go into the mantle transition zone between 410 and 660, and uh, sit there for some time. Of course, it cannot stay there forever. Eventually, it will sink into the deeper mantle. So the geometry of the subducting plates is very vivid and diverse with great curvature and complexity, and in some places, evidence for slab breakoff. Finally, the Banda Sea seism seismicity. The Banda Sea is located in eastern Indonesia. Uh, here's the island of Timor. Australia is here. And we're doing cross section C, C prime, that includes deep seismicity. And it seems that we can see evidence for the uh, Indian Australian plate subducting beneath the Banda Sea and actually folding and turning at the in the mantle transition zone, coming down and bending, as you can see here. Tremendously interesting. I will not dwell much on the focal mechanisms because it's a long, uh, complex subject uh, worthy of a lecture by itself. But let's just remember what these beach balls refer to. These are the lower hemisphere diagrams showing for a strike slip fault. We have the four quadrants for a thrust fault. Uh, this kind of diagram with the with the hanging wall sliding um, up, being pushed up. And for the, th the thrust fault, the normal fault, the hanging wall 
subsiding. So you get the um, tension axis in the center of the beach ball and here the compression in the center. So if you look at the deep interslab events at 582 kilometer depth beneath Sumatra, it's a normal fault. Normal faulting within the plate. In Java at a depth of 280, it's a thrust fault. Thrust faulting in the plate. And in the band of C, again, we're back to a strong component of normal faulting. Very difficult to understand the reason that we get these normal faulting mechanisms at a depth of nearly 600 kilometers into the Earth. But they're telling us about the deformation, deformation of the slab at those depths. Here's the, the Sumatran event, the 7.3 at, at 582 kilometers depth that's showing the normal faulting thrust faulting here in the, this Java event, and you can see uh, these other ones. The, the focal mechanisms, of course, out by the trench, show the thrust mechanisms that you would expect for underthrusting of the oceanic crust beneath the continental, active continental margin. So if we look at the number of earthquakes per year versus depth for these subduction systems, we get a very interesting pattern. Green is Sumatra. We get earthquakes to 200 kilometers, then nothing. For the overall Indonesian region, the number of earthquakes per year steadily declines to a depth of about 400 kilometers, then it shows some increase at the upper 400 kilometer boundary, then a decrease and increase within the mantle transition zone, and finally an abrupt decrease. What is the physics behind this phenomenon? Why do the number of earthquakes undergo a linear decrease to a depth of about 350 kilometers followed by an increase. This is the challenge. So now I'm introducing the Chandra Shankar Prize to anyone who can explain this diagram using scientific evidence. We need an explanation for the behavior of earthquakes in active subduction systems and uh, to explain this simple but very clear pattern of steady decrease down to 350, an increase, a decrease, an increase above the 660, and so on. It seems, some people suggest, that the cause and the mechanism of the earthquakes are quite different for different depths within the mantle. So maybe that's part of the answer. I cannot today give you a clear explanation for this clear pattern that we observe in the number of earthquakes as a function of depth. So let's just summarize. Eastern Indonesia <coughs> shows complex, very high level of seismicity. It's mostly concentrated at plate boundaries and the depth distributions do trace the Wadadi Benioff zone of subducting slabs as evidenced from seismic tomography. Deep interslab events differ in source mechanisms and seem to depend a lot on the stress at different locations. And we know from, from experience that intermediate to deep events pose a low seismic hazard because of their distance away from civilization. So what can we learn from active source seismology about the tectonics of this region. Here's a reflection profile where sources are arrayed along the surface, uh, many, many geophones, and we're looking for uh, reflections off of various boundaries. This has been done by the team from Geomar in Kiel, Germany, where they conducted a detailed survey of Lombok, Sumba Island and Java with a series of 
uh, seismic profiles as shown here in red. Tremendous investigation. From their data, you can see the actual subduction of the oceanic plate. This is the this is the top of the oceanic plate going down beneath the active margin, the Java uh, forearm. And here is another example with very rough seafloor topography. They indicate this could be seamounts. Tremendous success in imaging the subducting plate. Of very great significance is the identification of splay faults in the upper plate. Here's the oceanic crust being subducted beneath the Lombok forearc, and as this compression takes place, there are prominent spray fa splay faults which cause uh, topography at the seafloor. In many cases, we know that it is the splay faults rather than the uh, actual trench that creates the tsunamis. How do we know that? Timing. In many cases, when a large megathrust event occurs, the, o the ocean wave reaches the shore in half the time that you would expect if it were coming from the trench. It's, the reason is that this is coming off of uh, motion at the, at the seafloor on splay, splay faults, and they, ha they are much closer to shore, much more effective in pr producing tsunamis, and they arrived much earlier. This even happened in 1964 in the Great Alaska Earthquake, as documented by George Plasker of USGS. So not all seismogenic uh, earthquakes need to rupture all the way up to the trench. They may only rupture up to the splay fault, and that would be sufficient to cause a very deadly tsunami. The margin is also very well studied by active source seismic refraction, which gives us the velocities uh, within each each layer, and that tells us a lot about the composition. And this is from the summary by Hydrun Kopp, also from Geomar. They had they did, conducted many profiles along the Java Trench, Java and Sunda Trench in Java, Sumba Island, Lombok, and going over towards Timor. Let's take a look at just one example, because we don't have time to, this, this morning to look at all of these results. Here is the structure of the Java convergent margin, which is much higher resolution than could be obtained, for example, with earthquake tomography. It's possible to follow the oceanic crust about seven kilometers thick down beneath the forearc basin high, and that continues, as we know from the seismicity data, to great depth. Uh, above that, we have, in this case, an accretionary prism, low velocity sedimentary rocks, which have, which have been scraped off of the pretty old oceanic crust subducting here. And in the forearc, we have crystalline crust beneath the forearc basin. The forearc basin has uh, a variety of widths and thicknesses, but basically the forearc thickness appears to be about 15 to 20 kilometers thick. Very successful program, and it's based on studies that are using ocean bottom seismic recorders, OBSs, um, a new technology in the last 30 years, which has made big difference in our knowledge. So what are the hazards conclusions from the seismic reflection and refraction studies of the Java convergent margin? Seismogenic earthquakes are very common. We know from the seismicity studies. Splay faults are everywhere, and this is a real worry because the splay faults 
coming off of the mega thrust have the capability to cause great tsunamis that hit shore very early. And uh, furthermore, tsunamogenic landslides are also possible due to the steep slopes that were mapped with the seafloor mapping of these margins. A very dangerous and tectonically active convergent margin. So let's go to Sulawesi. We'll finish up with some a look at a northern island and uh, at the earthquake that occurred on a strike-slip fault in northern Sulawesi um, in 2018. There have been, in the last 20 years, almost one tsunamogenic earthquake per year in eastern Indonesia. And um, the, uh, some of the famous ones, the 7.4, located north of <clears throat> Sulawesi, the West Papua New Guinea event, and then various events that occurred uh, in near Timor and the, and the Banda Sea. These are characterized by low angle subduction um, faulting. However, the earthquake that I'm about to tell you about occurred on land and was a strike slip fault. So the, the study area is here with the beach ball. The beach ball is shown here and we're now in northern Sulawesi, and the uh, event occurred on land. The epicenter was on land September 28, 2018, magnitude 7.5, with a left lateral motion passing beneath Palu Bay and then coming back on shore at Palu City. Huge waves were generated, huge tsunami waves, maximum. Tsunami inundation was 469 meters, and the wave heights ranged from two to nine meters. Devastatingly large tsunami waves that came within minutes from a strike slip fall. Here is an example of the beach. Everything just completely wiped away from the beach. Talisi Beach is in northern part of uh, Palu. Uh, of course, I went to this, this uh, study area soon after the earthquake and tsunami to see it with my own eyes. Almost nothing left on the beaches. Now, if, <clears throat> if I were running a tsunami warning center and I did my seismology well and I determined from the focal mechanism that I had an earthquake with an epicenter on land, and it was a strike slip earthquake, I probably would not issue a very strong tsunami warning because it wasn't an offshore event and it didn't have a thrust mechanism uh, at a subduction zone. And yet you can see the effect of this, this earthquake. About 3,000 people died from the earthquake, ground shaking, the tsunami and liquefaction. So the Tagore Prize that I am offering, anyone who can explain how a strike slip fault on land can create a devastating tsunami with nine meters of run up height. How do you explain this kind of phenomenon? So this is the third and last prize, prize challenge prize for tonight's lecture. Of course, one, <clears throat> one idea is that there's some kind of geometry on the seafloor and that this geometry, this fault displacement, dis displaces some of the water. And of course, um, it could be some slumping in the bay accompanied by this earthquake. But this all needs to be verified, checked, quantified, and confirmed in terms of timing and amplitude of the wave. 
Liquefaction. Liquefaction refers to the um, liquefying of soft soil uh, caused by the uh, overpressuring of the pore fluid and it causes the soil to lose all of its strengths. And this happened during this earthquake. The strike slip earthquake <coughs> had a very high amount of motion here in the city. The epicenter was 60, uh, 80 kilometers to the north, but the final fault, finite fault solution shows about six meters of slip uh, next to the city. And the effect of that I think many of you have seen videos where houses are floating uh, like boats on a river as the landslide moves. This is the Ballarora uh, uh, soon, uh, landslide. This is before and after you can see the area that's been affected. If you go to this place, you do not see the houses at the surface anymore. They have been turned and churned and buried beneath the mud. So it's actually a, a very, very dangerous situation. The tsunami uh, that I'm referring to is this one here, Ballarora. And some of the staff of the earthquake center lost their own homes in this liquefaction. Catobo uh, landslide, here it is before. You can see many uh, one-story houses, agricultural fields, and the whole side of the hill just flowed like honey on a tilted surface. The ground shaking had a sufficient duration and amplitude and the pore pressure change was such that it was able to flow like this. The, the distance of this arrow is half a kilometer and enormous amount. This is the so-called head wall up here where the, uh, where the tsunami begins. This is the location of it. So it's this, although the Ballarora was right on the fault, this is located about four kilometers away from the faulting and indicates that the local conditions, including the soil saturation, plays a major role. And this is the final example I'll give. This is a narrow uh, tsunami. Here it is the before situation. Again, half a kilometer here. And it flowed like water in a river with a very fast motion. The angle of repose here is about 2.4 degrees. So it's a very low angle of repose, meaning that it just needs an earthquake with sufficient amplitude and duration to trigger uh, strong liquefaction. So this in red here is this landslide here. So the challenge we face as seismologists is that we tend to think that only uh, thrust faults at mega on on the mega thrust at trenches will cause strong tsunamis, and sometimes we think that earthquake damage is principally due to ground shaking. Well, the liquefaction effects can be equally devastating and and claim as many lives as the ground motion effects. So, in conclusion. There's the geometry of the of the fault. It's a strike slip fault passing through the city. This left lateral strike slip fault caused a huge tsunami and major uh, liquefaction. And tsunamis were not on the list, anyone's list for the natural hazards at this location. So we really need to do a better job of solving the problems of uh, earthquake, tsunami, and landslide hazards. So here are the three challenges that I offer you today. Try to explain the complexity of ocean-ocean subduction. The Chandra Sankar Prize I offer is for the earthquake depth 
number of earthquakes versus depth into the mantle that we just we see in clearly in Indonesia and what I call the Tagore Prize, how strikes of faulting can cause the tsunami. Thank you very much for your attention. The study of Indonesia is very rich in its rewards to anyone who chooses to go there. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to tell you of some of our progress. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your very nice uh, uh, and elaborate uh, talk. Um, now, may I request uh, Professor J.R. Kyle to say a few words? Yes. Walter, I think no words. We have overwhelmed us with the <laughs> fantastic, pre fantastic presentation and fantastic problems too. I had the opportunity to work with you for about a decade under the USGS UNESCO umbrella. And we were working on South Asia seismic analysis. Yeah. And I have observed you, how meticulous you are, how, you know, what is your insight in, in tackling the, you know, any seismological problems. So no wonder I'm not I'm not surprised that you have come with this really some practical sociological problem in Indonesia. We did not or could not do much during our UAGS UNESCO time in early 2000 for about for about a decade. But now you have done a tremendous job. With the, with the recent data in Indonesia. And because your data is only for last 20 years that you have handled, and they are all precise data. So there is no point of thinking how good locations, how good depth are your data. So your data is very good. And your observation is, is really, it asked me because so far our understanding is that well, subduction zone earthquakes are up to 700 kilometers below Java. But I did not come across maybe my ignorance. I did not come across there is a gap, you know, after 200 kilometers, yeah. there is a gap. And then there is a seismicity that I think you have given us a tremendous problem. And I hope there are some young student and researcher, they'll think on this problem of this gap you know, in the subduction structure. Then you have given another problem, the different source mechanism in the subduction zone, and how come this normal faulting, strike slip faulting happening at a deep data yeah. depth. There could be some, you know, could be that you have already mentioned, could be some tearing effect. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it needs very in-depth study. So that, that is a, another problem you have given. And I think you have, as usual, you know, you always something outstanding. You always give, you know, uh, very outstanding problem and outstanding uh, lectures. Then you have said that strike slip faulting on land generated tsunami. We never heard of it. <laughs> strike slip faulting in sea, in the trench, even does not create tsunami. And strike slip faulting on the land generated tsunami. So that is really another great, great uh, I think, uh, problem you posed and offered uh, three uh, fellowships or whatever for three problems. And I know many students come to USGS from all over, all over the world to do research under your guidance. So I hope there are some young scientists, some young students who can take up these problems because you have already given the problem. They don't have to search the problem. A PhD student, uh, you know, or a postdoctoral student, they try to, you know, find the problem and propose uh, the problem for a fellowship. But now you have given the problem, and you have given the fellowship, offered the fellowship. I think it is fantastic, uh, Walter. 
you are always fantastic. <laughs> so even on the virtual workshop, you are fantastic. Thank you Thank so much for your fantastic lecture. We have been educated. We have been delighted. Thank you so much. I think now you have to uh, face some few questions from the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I request Ms. Uh, Antara for question and answer session, please. Ms. Antara, how about you? Sir, first of all, I would like to thank you for your informative presentation. Sir, there are lots of query in the Q&A uh, section. So, uh, sir, may we proceed for those questions? Yes, yes, let's go forward. So may we proceed for those section, question and answer section? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Go ahead. So first question is from Divjati Goswami. Uh, the question is that does the seismic gap zone in the DD DD desk east of Java and EE desk boundary between Sumatra and Java uh, line indicates a locked zone or a zone with seismic uh, a seismic grouping? Is this a uh, potential zone for future mega earthquake? So the question is, um, if I can answer the cause of the of the gap in the seismicity uh, in eastern Java and Sumatra. At this point, I can only recommend that we um, undertake seismic tomography study to see whether or not the slab is continuous or whether it's a broken slab. Today, it's the answer is we don't know what is the cause. It's an open, open question. Okay, so thank you, sir. So next one is from Dr. D.K. Yadav. So the question is, what is the uh, double uh, subduction and why PXS falls in uh, di uh, dilatation uh, quadrants and TXS falls in uh, compression and quadrants? So um, what happens in some cases is a ocean basin will have a subduction zone pointing to the west on one side, on the western side, and another subduction zone directed towards the east. And if it go, undergoes compression, it, the, <laughs> the ocean, ocean crust becomes smaller, smaller, and smaller until, um, uh, until the, the ocean basin uh, disappears. So uh, this, I wouldn't believe until I saw it uh, with my own eyes, with the seismicity of the Celebes Sea in southern uh, Philippines. And the other part of the question was about the compression and dilatation. And uh, this, is, this is basically classical seismology uh, known as focal mechanisms with the uh, motion of the fault, the motion of the fault either causing a compressional quadrant or, or a dilatational Project from a poll. I think this this can be uh, this can be read in detail even on Wikipedia. So I will not go into a great explanation right for that. Thank you, sir. So next question is: uh, Is it possible to take electromagnetic wave into consideration in place of seismic wave for earthquake prediction or for PSHA? Is there any similarity between the electromagnetic wave and seismic wave? Oh, this is a really good question. This is a wonderful question. What, what about electromagnetic waves? Well, I should first of all apologize that I didn't discuss electromagnetic contributions to studying the subsurface of the Earth. Obviously, the Earth is a has varying conductivity. At the near surface, we have wet sediments, and they conduct electricity well. And as we go into the deep Earth, maybe a granitic pluton, very low conductivity. We also call that high resistivity. So electromagnetic methods are very powerful and they're very well applied in India uh, to a variety of problems like looking at basins and so on. Now the top the question included the the uh, issue whether electromagnetic waves can in some way help to predict earthquakes. Well so far in the view of most experts, we don't have a way of predicting earthquakes, neither with electromagnetics nor with radon gases or with seismicity patterns. 
We haven't found that solution. Um, electromagnetic studies of earthquake prediction continue in many countries. I know that it's continuing in India, in Japan, and China, but we're waiting for the solution and we don't know when, if or when it will come. Thank you for that question. Thank you, sir. So next one is uh, the number of seismic events incre uh, increases in 410 kilometer and 660 kilometer depths as shown, which can be correlated with two of the major mental discontinuities. Can the phase change of olivine uh, olivin that occurs in these two depths be responsible for this phenomena? Very good, very good question. And I think the person asking this question is already well on the way to the Chandra Shankar prize because they are hinting at the solution. Yes, the fact that there is these phase boundaries at 410, yes. uh, peridotite, uh, uh, olivine going to Wadsleyite, uh, these phase changes must be part of the solution. So, one suggestion is that these, this increase in earthquakes is, is a reflection of the phase change that occurs at that boundary. But of course, we need to demonstrate that somehow, either mathematically or with better observations. But this, right. this questioner is already well on the way. My hat is off to this clever person for- uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Already <laughs> a great deal of insight. Thank you, sir. So may we proceed for more questions? Yes, of course. Okay, thank you, sir. So next one is there, what is the minimum amount of ground motion acceleration and the duration can cause uh, liquefaction in areas like Northeast India? Wow, this is a very good question. I will repeat it. What is the lowest amount of ground acceleration and uh, seismic duration that would be necessary to generate liquefaction in Northeast India, or for that matter, in any location. This is a major research topic, and I have been looking into it very carefully. You know, in the current example in Palu, Indonesia, where I showed that great liquefaction events, there were no seismometers. We do not have ground motion measurements, uh, either accelerometer or velocity from any instrumentation. So part of the reason that we are limited in our ability to answer the, the questioner adequately is a, a lack of data. Now, the um, uh, Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Institute at UC Berkeley has an available online database of all liquefaction events and the ground motions that were measured. So we're at the beginning. This is like a new horizon. We're like being on a ship and seeing just the top of the palm tree. We're just beginning to get into view of understanding and quantifying the liquefaction process. But today, today I cannot tell you um, uh, the answer to, to the question. I can only tell you one hint. I talked to the world's expert and he said he's beginning to suspect that duration, the duration of ground shaking is more important than the peak ground acceleration because the peak ground acceleration can be very short duration. It may only last a second or half a second. So maybe I would, I would hint to your, the questioner, he or she should look into the duration. This may be the key effect. Thank you, sir. So the next one is, can we think of overla overlapping strike slip fault uh, causing tsunamis, just like transpressive zone? Oh my God, this person is getting close to winning that prize too. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, the C. V. Raman Prize can be uh, may, can be soon given out. Yes, the the solution to the strike slip faulting problem could be given by offset stepping, where you get thrust faulting in between in between the offset strike slip steps. So I agree with the uh, questioner that actually 
a long fault, 120 kilometer long fault, like the like the Palu earthquake fault, is not composed of one single strand. It should have offsets, and these offsets may be the clue that provide the mechanism for generating a tsunami beneath the bay. Good point. Oh my God, these these prizes are going to be given out quickly. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Next one is from Januka. The uh, question is, uh, yes. would the thrust to normal faulting uh, be related to slab bending and unbending? Uh, bending and unbending generates different stress regimes. Very good suggestion. Bending and unbending, that's a very good suggestion. And I think that the way to look at that one is to look at that example that I showed in the Banda Sea where we have the slab bending and look at the uh, look at the mechanisms there. Um, so the, uh, the the proof of the pudding would be to look more closely at the data. But this is a very good hypothesis that slab bending and unbending can be related to the mechanisms that we're discussing. So now we have two competing hypotheses for these normal and thrust faulting for deep events. One would be uh, phase change related. The other would be slab bending and unbending. So you see we already have two competing camps that have to look for the truth. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I think one more question, uh, Antara, okay. and then you can stop. Uh, uh, from Dr. R. Arun Prasad. The so question is regarding the seismicity gap between shallow and uh, fruit levels, it's uh, possible that the thermal and density condition make the gripping kind of deformation which does produce uh, recordable earthquakes. What is the role? Uh, so I didn't quite get that. The, the question is uh, about the seismic Speaking. gap. And uh, say that, what, can, can you s explain it one more time? What's the question? Yes. Regarding the seismicity gap between shallow and fluid levels, yeah, mm -hmm. it's pos uh, it is possible that the thermal and density condition make the creeping kind of deformation, which does not produce recordable earthquake. What is the role uh, role of thermal runway in those deeper events? Well, uh, the the uh, the questioner suggests that uh, there are no recordable earthquakes. But you know the the sensitivity of the instrumentation is increasing all the time, and um, so uh, any any earthquake magnitude four or greater would be detected by the uh, instruments. And now using the uh, Indonesian network, the local Indonesian network, uh, we can test the questioner's idea because they have put out 150 uh, broadband seismometers right on the islands. So it's a good suggestion, and I, uh, I, I think that we can evaluate that with new data. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Yes, uh, I think. And thank you, Ms. Andara. Now, may I request uh, Dr. Pibangsu to go ahead with his vote of thanks. Over to Dr. Pibangsu. So very good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, on behalf of CSI and East and IBW GST 2020 entire family, would like to convey you my sincere thank you for sparing us your precious time. So your lecture has imparted us with momentous knowledge, pattern about the tectonics and seismicity of Southeast Indonesia and Southeast Asia. So once again, I convey you my sincere thank you. I would also thank like you. to thank Director CSI and East for uh, being supportive throughout the entire program so that it can be a success. I would also like to thank Dr. J. Kyle, Professor Jaya Kyle, sir, and Dr. Saruburwa, sir, um, for the substance, substantial support towards this workshop. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Santanu Burwa, sir, for his imperative initiative 
to unite the entire worldwide scientific community in a single platform. Last but not the least, I'd like to thank all the members and participants of, of IBW GST 2020. A very warm namaste to everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank